How does this sense of identity figure in Woolf's own fictional writing? Is the I present in Woolf's prose? What's going on in terms of subject identity, subjective identity in Woolf's fiction? Let's think about that question by having a look at a passage from Woolf's novel Mrs Dalloway, one of my favourite novels, which was published in 1929. In this scene, the eponymous heroine, if you like, of this novel, Mrs Dalloway, is walking down the street in London. And she's involved, as she often is, in a reverie. She's thinking about her past and she's thinking about her future. She's remembering things. She's anticipating her own death, in fact. That's what's happening in this passage. Mrs Dalloway is thinking what it might be like to die. Did it matter then, she asked herself, walking towards Bond Street? Did it matter that she must inevitably cease completely? All this must go on without her? Did she resent it? Or did it not, did it not become consoling to believe that death ended absolutely? But that somehow in the streets of London, on the ebb and flow of things, here, there, she survived. She being part, she was positive of the trees at home, of the house there, ugly, rambling all to bits and pieces as it was, part of people she had never met, being laid out like a mist between the people she knew best. I think the first thing to notice about this passage, which for me is really fascinating, is that there's no I. There's no first person pronoun, singular. There's no I. That's on a kind of simple and technical level. It's not a first person narrative. There's a narrator there describing Mrs Dalloway. So Mrs Dalloway is she. But on a more profound, dare I say it, metaphysical level, Mrs Dalloway has no fixed identity. She describes herself as a kind of mist that stretches between different people, even people she's never known. Not only that, but parts of her identity inhabit trees, the trees in her garden, the bricks of her house, even as the house, like she, is crumbling and falling apart. There is a sense of dispersal in this passage, the sense of an identity, a subject, which is not centred phallically in the hard and fast eye, but which spreads out like a veil or like a mist between other things and other people. And think about the narrative voice in this passage. As I said a moment ago, this uh, isn't a novel which is narrated in the first person. There's a narrator there describing Mrs Dalloway. So Mrs Dalloway is a she, is another entity, is a different person from the narrator. But at the same time, the narrator sees Mrs Dalloway's thoughts, sees her feelings, is inside of Mrs Dalloway's mind. There are two identities, but they're working cooperatively. They're working together to produce this writing, which is Mrs Dalloway. In a sense, the narrator lets the character speak through her. And so we're confronted with a very different scenario from the one that Wolf was exploring in a room of one's own, where there's this single male voice who's not disclosing the world, but obscuring it, standing in front of it. So perhaps where, as Hélène Sixou suggested, fiction has been a source of coercion or even has helped to disguise the kinds of coercions that women have suffered, Fiction can also be a tool to help to liberate women's consciousness or to reveal the ways in which women's consciousness is not restricted in the way of the male I, the male first person singular. Perhaps women's writing can be a way of exploring different modes of identity. So for the last part of the podcast, let's look briefly at a different form of writing by a woman. And let's think about what women's poetry of the 20th century can tell us about the making of identity. So I'm going to read to you now 
from the first two and a half stanzas of a poem by Sylvia Plath, who was writing after Wolfe but before Sixu in the 1950s. This is the beginning of Plath's poem, Virgin in a Tree. We're just talking about trees with Wolfe and Mrs Dalloway, so this seems to me to be an interesting point of continuity. A relationship between women and trees is being explored in this poem. How this tart fable instructs and mocks. Here's the parody of that moral mousetrap set in the proverbs stitched on samplers and approving chaste girls who get them to a tree and put on bark's nun black habit which deflects all amorous arrows. For to sheath the virgin shape in a scabbard of wood baffles pursuers whether goat-thighed or god-haloed. Ever since that first Daphne switched her incomparable back for a bay tree's hide, respects twined to her hard limbs like ivy. Quite a taut and sharp and tart form of writing we see here. And indeed that word tart involves a play, the third word of the poem. Tart can mean both a kind of sharpness of taste. If you have a piece of cake, a lemon cake, which is too lemony, it will taste tart. But also, we, as we know, tart is a derogatory term that men have historically applied to women who seem not to be chaste. And similarly, there's a play going on in this poem around the word chaste. There's a punning on that word, by which I mean chaste in the sense of chastity, a woman who is chaste, and chaste in the sense of to give chase, a woman who is pursued or chaste. There is a particular mythological reference going on in this reference to that second form of chaste, the woman who is pursued. Plath talks about goat-thighed and god-haloed pursuers. And she's referring there in part to the story of a nymph, a, a, a classical mythological figure called Daphne, who was a sort of spirit of the river and with whom Apollo, the god Apollo, fell in love and chased through the wood until Daphne arrived at the river bank and called out to her father to save her from Apollo, to save her from her pursuer. And her father changed Daphne into a bay tree just as Apollo was about to capture her. And Apollo puts his hand in one version of the myth on the bay tree and he can still feel Daphne's heart beating through the bark. So like Mrs Dalloway, this is a poem which is about women and trees and the way in which women can become parts of trees. A kind of organic, earthy quality to women is being explored here. I should also say that the most famous version of this mythological story is a version that was written by the Roman poet Ovid in his Metamorphoses, which are stories of transformation and change. It's important to bear in mind as well that Apollo is or was the god of poetry. And when uh, he realised that he wasn't going to capture Daphne, when she transformed into a tree before his eyes, he broke off a branch from this bay tree and put it in his hair which became the origin for the laureate, for the bay crown that, uh, that military victors in ancient Rome wore and later on poets wore. And this is where the, our word laureate, as in poet laureate, comes from, from the laurel crown worn by the poets of ancient Rome. So this is a poem which again is a, about poetry, actually. It's a poem about the origin of poetry and a poem about the ways in which poetry emerges out of dissatisfied male lust and the transformation of a woman into a part of nature to save her virginity. But Plath's take on this fable, as she calls it, is a very different one. It seems to me that she isn't condoning the practice of preserving one's virginity as it were, 
It seems to me that she's troubled by the way that women are placed into two different categories, an idealised category of the chaste virgin and a denigrated category of the tart, to go back to that word that I mentioned a moment ago. And indeed, in this poem, she's responding to a particular uh, graphic representation of this scene, an etching by an artist called Leonard Baskin called Virgin in a Tree. It's a really disturbing image, I think, this one. The Virgin looks unhappy, old, dried up, tart, lemony, splayed out on a tree. She hasn't become the tree in the way of the chaste, nubile Daphne. She's inhabited the tree and she's almost become wood-like, but she's still a human being. So like Hélène Sixou, who I was discussing at the beginning of this podcast, I think that Plath in this poem and in her response to this image is exploring some of the myths around women and the ways in which women have been both idealised and denigrated in the process of producing male writing. Thanks very much. <laughs>